So we've been talking about the basic threading libraries in Java, and we saw how we could use the join method to create some code that adds up a, uh, a bunch of numbers for us and do it in a thread safe way. And the join basically allowed us to, to stop until we had all of these threads had finished doing their work. Before we look at some of the other thread methods, I think it's actually worth looking at how we would translate this to use futures because in some ways the better way to do this is using futures. So we're going to make another app and it's going to be called future sum. And I'll start off by actually copying the code from thread sum over into future sum. Now I want to change things up a little bit. So we still have to make our numbers. We still need a number of threads here. Uh, but I'm not going to make threads. That's actually going to be my number of futures. And so I'm not going to yield a new thread. I'm going to yield a future. We can do an import to bring that in. And of course, in order to start up a future, we have to have an execution context. So we'll bring in the global execution context. Whereas the thread needed to have a, a run method that was overridden in it, our futures don't. Our futures give back a value. So our threads needed to have this array of things that were going to be mutated. It mutated them, and then it used that mutation at the end. The future gives back a value to us. And so instead of making it so that this is going in some array. I'm going to go ahead and just make it so this gives back a sum. Now, of course, I could change this code to be more functional, but I'm actually interested here in making it resemble the thread sum. So I keep the same for loop in there, but I'm just mutating a local variable. And the fact that it's a local variable means that we can't screw this up. Okay, one of the things we could have messed up here was if somehow we had multiple threads adding to the same element in the array, well, then we'd create race conditions. I can't do that here because this is a local variable. I don't need to do the, I don't need to start them, futures start on their own, I don't need to join them because the futures don't give you back a value until they're done. But I do need to change this a little bit. Now, sum itself is an in is a sequence of futures of doubles. And what I really need is to have a future of sequences. You might recall that we can do that by calling future.sequence. And that will give us back our sequence. And so that will be a sequence of doubles. And we can just get the sum of that, much like what we had done previously. So future dot sequence, oh, sorry, dot for each. And then we run it on there. Sums. OK, so we convert sums, which is a sequence of futures, to be a future of sequences. And then the for each gives us back that sequence. And we can do the sum on this. Now, if we just run that as written, it turns out it just terminates. This is one big difference between the threads that are behind the futures, or what are uh, referred to as um, fork join threads. And they're actually part of the Java library. They are kind of, in, you might think of them in some ways as being less robust than the, the normal threads. At the very least, they are less demanding. These normal threads will keep the entire application alive. As long as one of these threads is going, the application can't stop. The fork join threads don't do that. And so when our main thread comes to an end down here, the whole application stops. There are various ways I could make them stay awake, uh, but I'm just going to put in a little sleep there. I'll say longer sleep 
to make it so that we wait long enough to get our value. Uh, that's not necessarily the ideal way, but of course in a larger application, I wouldn't be worried about this because there would be other things that would be happening that would keep the main thread awake. Um, otherwise, I need to do something in here that probably pulls on the futures to make sure that we don't terminate the application until they're all done. The thing that we want to notice here though is that the future code is in many ways less error prone than what we had done over here. There are less details that they kind of we have to worry about because once we get it to compile, the library is doing it for us. The fact that the futures calculate their own values, that we don't have to store them, the fact that this for each will automatically schedule things to happen when the, the futures have completed as opposed to us having to join the threads. So what are some of these other methods that we have? We've looked in the in here. We've just been playing with join and we said there are other joins that have delays on them. Uh, one of the methods that we've used quite a bit is sleep. Now sleep is a static method and you can pass it how long you want it to sleep. That basically causes the current thread to wait until some roughly some period in the future. You're not guaranteed it will be woken up in exactly this many milliseconds, but it'll be close to it. There's another method that you won't call all that much called yield. It's also a static method. And the description you know, kind of tells you what it's going to do. It tells the scheduler, it's kind of like doing a sleep, but without having a forced delay. It tells this thread, it tells this thread scheduler, hey, you can, I'll give up my resources right now and some other thread can come in and use my place. Of course, if you have more cores than you have threads, yield isn't going to do anything. But if you have more threads running than you have cores, yield would let something else take, uh, take advantage of it. If you're using futures, you won't ever have to do this. The reason I bring it up though is that it shows an interesting aspect of the Scala syntax. So this is a method like sleep that we would call on uh, on the current thread using the thread object in, in Scala terms. But you can clearly see the problem there. Yield is a keyword in Scala. We used it right here. It goes with for loops. You can't use it like this. So how do you call a method that happens to be a keyword? And the answer to that is you put it inside of backticks. So the backticks are uh, on, an, on an American keyboard, they're on a key that's up by the number one. Um, and you can stick something inside of backticks and that tells Scala to interpret this, you know, kind of literally and do not treat it as, as a keyword. So if you feel like you need to call yield, this is how you would need to do it. You can also get hold of the current thread. So things like yield and sleep are uh, are static methods, but if for some reason you feel that you need to get hold of the thread that is currently running, and actually for debug statements this can be handy, it's handy to print out the thread that's currently running so that you can know which thread you're in, because when you're debugging multi-threaded programs they're, they're challenging to deal with. The current thread is a static method, so you'd call thread.currentThread, and it would give you back a thread object which is the thread that's currently running. You can also vary priorities. Uh, you can get the priority of a thread and you can set the priority of a thread. And this tells the scheduler to you know, run something more often or less often rate relative to other threads. For the most part, you really shouldn't be doing this much. This is one of those things that uh, if if you really have to fine tune the performance of some application, you could do it, but you really need to know what you're doing because most likely if you try to go down to that level, uh, you're probably messing things up. You'll also notice there are a number of methods in here that are listed as deprecated. And those are worth pointing out simply because you should never ever call them. So we see uh, count stack frames, destroy is one, uh, resume is one, stop and suspend are others. And the reason why these are deprecated, and just describing why stop and, and suspend are deprecated is sufficient. The stop method was put in there because it seemed like a good idea originally 
to allow one thread to tell another thread to stop. It turns out that's really a horrible, horrible idea and you should never ever do it. There is a link here as to why these things are deprecated. But really it comes down to resources. Imagine that this thread had a file open or was doing something else using some particular resource. Well, it's up to that thread to clean up that resource. It needs, you know, as, as we well know, when you open a file, you need to close the file. If you were to stop a thread that had a file open, that thread could never close the file. And similar types of bad things can happen with suspend. Basically, if you allow one thread to interrupt another thread, it can interrupt it when it's in a state where it should not be interrupted, and it can leave things in very bad situations. As a result, these methods were deprecated. If you were to uh, call them, so thread dot current thread dot stop, you would get this nice little line through effect here where it's telling you this is deprecated, don't use it. Um, and you really, really, really should not use them. Calling those deprecated methods can do very bad things inside of your program. So avoid using stop and, re and, and suspend and therefore resume. You might wonder, how do I stop another thread? What you have to do is have basically potentially a var that is a Boolean that is, that is being checked on regularly. So if you have some loop inside of your code, what you're going to do is you will, inside of that loop, you check to see whether this Boolean has been set, and if it has, then you terminate the thread naturally. You make it so that everything after that point, basically it exits the loop and it doesn't keep doing more work. And that way the thread can terminate, um, as opposed to what was happening uh, with stop, where the outside thread actually gets to decide when it, when it kills it. The advantage of this is if I had a file open, I could jump out of my loop immediately, close the file, and then let the thread stop in a, nat in a natural way.